Welcome to the Reach Podcast with your teacher, Pastor Taylor Gabbard. If you've ever taken a test in school and you felt while you were taking that test just super confident, one of two things was happening. Either you had prepared and you were ready, you knew the answers, or you were so unprepared that you had no idea how wrong you were about everything. And there's always this weird feeling when you're super confident on a test of like, well, that was either an A or I bombed. The key, the best way to have confidence when you take a test is to study and prepare for it. When you study and you prepare, then you get to this place where even though there's some nerves, even though there's some shakiness, as you take the test, you begin to see that you're prepared. You see that your study is paying off, and there's confidence as that happens. It may surprise some of you to find out that there was a time in my life when I took voice lessons. (laughs) <laughs> Some of you found that out this week, and I, I've heard it was shocking, and I was told you didn't believe it because it's never been used in a sermon illustration, so here we are. <laughs> now, what I will tell you is that my senior year of college, I needed to get to 12 hours to be full-time, and voice lessons was an option. Do you know what the final is for voice lessons? Because I failed to think that far into the future. The final for voice lessons is you have to sing a song in front of real people. (laughs) Now, here's the thing. I prepared for tonight. And because I prepared for tonight, I have a certain level of confidence about what I have to say. I did not prepare very diligently for that voice lesson final. And it went horribly. In all reality, I really should have stuck to modeling. (laughs) I had zero confidence in that final, and it, it went just as it should have gone. It went horribly. We are in a series in 1 John. And 1 John, I've told you, it's the book written about assurance. The idea is this, if you've, if you've been in church for very long, you've probably heard or read in the Bible the passage where some people are going to get up to heaven and Jesus is going to say, I didn't know you. I don't know who you are. And if you've spent any time thinking about that, it is the most terrifying passage in the Bible. Because what it, what it instills in us is this idea that like, we might get to heaven and find out then too late, that we didn't actually know God. We didn't actually know Jesus. But here's the thing. That's not what that passage is meant to do. That passage is meant to wake up the person, to shake up the person who never prepared, who threw Jesus' name around a bunch, but they didn't actually care to know him, or spend time with him, or even figure out what the gospel was. It's not designed to instill fear in the hearts of believers. And 1 John is an entire book given to us so that as believers, we can look at ourselves and we can see the signs of what a believer is, and we can have confidence that someday when we stand before God, we'll be his. God did not design that you would just have to kind of die and figure it out. Fingers crossed, hope for the best. We'll see if God's in a good mood when I get to the gate. That's not the idea. There's a way that you can know that you know God. And that is the concept behind the book of 1 John. How do we have confidence before God? Well, the way that you have confidence before God is that you obey Him. And that's a little tricky because I'm constantly being disobedient to him. 
So what does it actually mean to obey him? It's not just following a list of rules. We obey God by loving God and loving others. Essentially, when we realize that the gospel is that God has actually fulfilled the law for us, that God has kept all the regulations, that Jesus lived the perfect life, that now, because I love him and I react to the love that he has given me, I can walk in freedom, I can walk knowing that I'm his. And that manifests in actual physical actions. We have confidence because we love the brothers. Look with me at 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we are to love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And for what reason did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil, but his brothers were righteous. So he says from the beginning. Now, this is the interesting part. You'll often hear people say the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, they're, they're different. You'll, you'll run into people who will say people got saved different in the Old Testament than they did in the New Testament. If you just take a, take a passive scroll through the beginning of the, the, New, or the Old Testament, you run into so many rules, you think, okay, it must have been about rules. right? But the reality is, when he says from the beginning, he doesn't mean just from the moment you heard it. He means from the very beginning of the message, it was about loving others. Now, he references one of the first unloving acts in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 4, Cain and Abel, because he's saying, that's the beginning I'm talking about. From the very beginning, you were told it was about loving God and loving others. What happened with Cain and Abel? Cain technically kept the rule. He technically did what he was supposed to do. He went to God with a sacrifice, with an offering. And yet he was rejected because he had no love in his heart. All he was doing was keeping a rule. And his brother Abel, his brother Abel's sacrifice was accepted because he loved God. And then something strange happens. Abel is not, it's not like he's over here going, Cain, gotcha. Get you next time too. No, he wasn't rubbing it in. Cain hated Abel because Abel loved God. Because Abel was righteous. See, the reality is that from the very beginning, we were told that there is going to be a seed of the woman. And that seed of the woman, it, it's a double reference. It's a reference to Jesus himself, that he would eventually come, that he would be the seed that moves all the way from Adam and Eve all the way to Jesus coming. But we're also told that that seed means everybody who belongs to Jesus, all the children of God are the seed of the woman. And then we're told that they will be opposed to the seed of the evil one, that there will be descendants of the evil one and that they will hate the descendant of the woman. They will hate Jesus, and because they hate Jesus, they will hate everybody who belongs to Jesus. So right off the bat, essentially we're being told there are two camps of people in life. Those who love God and his children, and those who hate God and his children. The question is, which one of these two groups are you in? Look at verse 13. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life remaining in him. It says, like Cain, the world hates the righteous. Why? Why is that? Because the righteous are a pesky reminder that they're not living rightly. Right? See, Abel didn't have to do anything to Cain. He just existed in love with God. And when Cain didn't love God, that was incredibly annoying. See, Christians are a reminder to a world living in sin that there is a right answer. Now, that doesn't mean we're never sinful, that we never do anything we're not supposed to do. What it means is when I sin, I repent of my sin. I go to the Lord and I say, 
God, I love you. I don't want to love my sin. I don't want to be in sin. Save me from even the sinful action I just committed. And that's annoying to somebody who doesn't want to give up their sin. They want to hold on to it. And you are just reminding them that they already know the truth, that they're wrong. No one wants to face that fact when they're trying to hold on to their sin. John says, we know that we have passed from death into life. I always want to pause and, and contemplate that sentiment. What does it mean to pass from death into life? What is death? There's a level at which the thing we fear the most is that we will cease to be physically present and conscious in this life. I want you to understand that that is almost never what the Bible is talking about when it talks about death and life. See, you could be walking around in this world, totally conscious, totally aware, and you can be completely dead. Because life and death are tied to whether or not you are in the presence of God or not. See, death, full-fledged, full-sin death, is hell. It's a full separation from God and who He is. And on the other hand, life, full-fledged, full-sin life, is being in connection with God. That's what heaven is. Well, you might say to yourself, well, I'm not in hell and I'm not in heaven. Well, here's the thing. The moment that you get saved and that connection is reestablished between you and God, you are experiencing an unperfected version of heaven. You are beginning to live life. And before that moment, when you are in sin and you are fully separated from God, you are living in hell. Now, here's the thing. Why is it that People can seem to live in hell and not mind it because the echoes of God's grace are all around us. Everything good in life is because God is good. And so even somebody who is living their temporary partial hell, walking around in this life separated from God, they can still eat delicious food and drink thirst-quenching water. They can still experience a good night's sleep. But see, someday... Someday, if they die physically in that separation, they're going to go to a place where water doesn't quench thirst, and food doesn't satiate the appetite, and sleep is impossible. See, because every single echo of God's grace will not exist there. And right now, you can experience life and if someday you can experience it in full, or you can live in death, and someday you can experience that in full. He says, we know that we have passed from death into life. That's, what is it? That's salvation. That's what we're talking about when we talk about getting saved. You know, we use that lingo all the time. What are we getting saved from? Death. That's the whole point. We move from death into life if we what? Love the brothers. Now, I want you to understand that you cannot rip that out of context. If you've been here for the whole series, we talked about this. That is not merely to say that you have warm, fuzzy feelings about the person next to you that you're friends with in the church, right? That means that you love the church and everybody that makes up the church. You can't rip that out of context. That's how people end up saying, well, I don't need to go to church, I can do church at home. That's not how that works. Because we are the church, and so you have to love what God loves. You have to be connected to what God is connected to. Here's the thing. Think about the things that the church is described as in the Bible. The church is described as God's children. How good of friends are you going to be with a parent when you tell them you hate their kids? Okay, it's described as the bride of Christ. How good of friends are you going to be with a husband when you tell him you hate his bride? These things don't work. You can't say, I love God, but I hate all you, his children. I hate you, his bride. It doesn't work like that. 
And, then, and, and think about the context of 1 John. You've got this group called the heretics that have come into the church, and they've said, we've got the Father, but we don't need Jesus or the church. We've special knowledge. We, we've got the thing that gets us to God without that. And John's point is, you can't be connected to God and not connected to everyone else God is connected to. It doesn't work like that. You can't hate what God loves and love God. Then you get further into that verse, and it's, it says that everyone who, who hates his brother is a murderer. And immediately it's like, oh, okay, I don't know about that. Like, that seems pretty harsh. Here's the thing. This is Matthew 5, starting in verse 21. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder, and whoever commits murder shall be answerable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be answerable to the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be answerable to the supreme court, and whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Okay, so we read that, and it still doesn't quite click. It's like, I, okay, so I, I call somebody a fool, and I'm going to hell for it? And I'm convinced that that's why God gave us the second example. Because if you jump down a little bit further in chapter 5, it says, You have heard it said that you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust, with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now if your right eye is causing you to sin, tear it out and throw it away from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Think about that for a second. It has absolutely nothing to do with your actions, whether you're guilty of sin. Your actions are merely the outcome of the sin that's already inside of you. Sin exists in your person. Corruption is with you, whether you can see it or not. I want you to think about this. It is actually a blessing in your life that sometimes you see your sin. What would happen if you were guilty of sin in your heart and you never saw it come out? You would never know you need to be saved. You would never know something was wrong. Now, Paul, Paul immediately answers the next thought. Should we just keep sinning then? No, that's not the point. That is not, it's not freedom to now sin in whatever way you can or want to. The idea is this. When I see my sin, when I even think about my sin, when I lust, when I have anger, I know that that murder and that adultery is in my very flesh to the deepest part of me, I'm guilty. The truth is that when you hate your brother, you're as guilty as if you had murdered them. Because all sin is just a rejection of God in your heart your actions are only revealing that rejection in your heart. James chapter 2, verse 8 says, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as violators. For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles in one point, has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a violator of the law. See, here's the thing. That's even further clarification on what Jesus said. It's not simply that if you have anger, you've committed murder, and if you have lust, you've committed adultery. It's that if you have had anger, you've committed adultery. If you have lust, you've committed murder. Why? Because God looks at all sin, and he says, you're a lawbreaker. You have sinned against me. You've rejected me. You have violated what I have told you to be, which is perfection. And if you have fallen through it even one place, you've broken everything. And so there's this, there's this reality that we have to come to, that we have to face, where we realize that the sin I see is not equivalent of the sin I have. So how then, when I see how deep my sin goes, how do I have confidence in, in my salvation, in knowing that God has saved me? If simply 
disliking, hating a brother makes me guilty of all the breaking of the law, of all murder, of all adultery. See, I want you to see something. Loving the church, loving your brothers, it's not natural. The world doesn't naturally love God's children, and they don't love the gathering of God's children. I'm not saying that you are going to be equally best friends with every single person that you run into at church. Sometimes our personalities clash because we're all sinners in very close proximity. There's a difference, though, between that, between not being equally invested into the 1,500 people you run into every Sunday and actively knowing in your heart that you hate someone, that you wouldn't go out of your way to do anything for them. See, that should bother you. Now, why did we, why did we talk about at the beginning of this? There is something about sin that is designed to be a pain response. Because as you question, am I really saved or not? And you look at the fact that you hate someone, that should cause you to recoil from that hatred and go, I don't want to do that. That makes me wonder if I'm saved. And then once I realize that that brings up all these questions about my salvation, it causes me to say, Lord, take that away from me. It causes me to go to that person and say, I need to apologize to you. I need to be reconciled to you because I'm called to love you. I'm called to be sacrificial for you. See, the whole point, the way that we have confidence is not that we don't ever see our sin. That's the person that didn't prepare for the test, getting every answer wrong and thinking they're doing great. The way we have confidence is that we stare the depth of our sin directly in the face and we repent of it. And all sin, I want you to see, it's not just this list of regulations and rules. All sin is about whether or not we love God and love his children. That's the point. How do you love? Immediately, some of you are saying, well, I don't hate anybody. I don't hate people. Well, let's see. Let's look at the definition. We have confidence before God when we love the brothers. Look at verse 16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. But whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? We know love by this, that Christ died on the cross for us. Romans 5 says, and, I, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's look at the definition of love for a second. See, in verse 16, it says the definition of love is that Christ died for us while we were still his enemies. And then in the verse 17, this is, this is John's point. He says, Christ died while you were still a sinner, died while you were still a sinner, and you can't even go out of your way to take care of somebody out of your surplus when they're in need. Here's the thing. We're called to Christ's likeness, and we don't even do the bare minimum. What is Christ like? It's dying for people. It's a sacrificial, self-sacrificing love that gives yourself for them. And somebody says, man, I'm really struggling financially. I'm really, I'm really having trouble paying this bill. And you're like, mm, I really don't want to give my Starbucks money away. Yeah, are you kidding me? How is that sacrificial? How is that loving your brother? How is that going out of the way for someone? Here's the thing. Do you want to know what the biggest obstacle to loving people is? You might love them and then they will hurt you. That is terrifying. That's what keeps us from plugging in. That's what keeps us from serving. That's what keeps us from going out of our way for other people. What if I do that and they stab me right in my vulnerable, open, and offered heart? 
And here is the truth. Jesus loved you while you were actively stabbing him in the heart. See, the reality of the gospel is this. Christ didn't wait for you to be at peace with each other before he died for you. You are the one that killed him. And there's this lie in our head that if I had been there, I would have been different. I wouldn't have done that. The reality is every single one of us would have been the Roman soldiers slapping him, whipping him, persecuting him, mocking him, and nailing him to the cross. Even Peter. Peter, right? The superstar. The rock that Christ builds the church on. Even in that moment, he couldn't even stand by Jesus. Even he denied him. Christ took his heart and he offered it to us and he said, I want to love you. Well, we were actively spitting in his face and we can't turn around for our own brothers and sisters in the church and take the most minor of hits, the most minor of inconveniences when we're called to literally die for each other. Are you willing to love people with your money? What about your time? Maybe you don't have a lot of money. Are you willing to give your time? Be available? Maybe just give effort. Willing to go out of your way for somebody who needs help one day? Even if it's going to inconvenience you? Are you willing to give up some of your sleep? What if all that person needs is for you to answer your phone in the middle of the night? Some of you have gone through the nights where you wish somebody would just answer their phone. Are you willing to chase Jesus in a way that gives yourself, even at the expense of yourself? See, because here's the thing. What I would love is to tell you that if you just go out there and you just love people, that, oh man, it'll just be returned tenfold and you'll just always be loved. And you know what? By, by far and away, that, that is how it works out in church. It's great. We love each other. And so there's, there's, there's this action in which I love people in the church, and they love me back, and it's great. And then every now and again, I love someone, and they stomp on me. And it's that moment when my flesh really boils to the top, and it's like, all right, well, I know who I'm killing next. But my, my job in that moment is to kill me to kill my flesh, to sacrifice my pride and to say, I don't care if that person just stomped on me. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to have patience with them, be gentle with them. I'm going to trust them into God's hands. I'm going to sacrifice myself for them. Look at verse 18. Little children, let not lo let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Pause right there. What is that literally? Don't ever let anybody tell you that the Bible is not relevant. Verse 18 is the New Testament, first century way of saying thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. Hope everything's going well. It doesn't do anything for anybody. Posting some kind of support meme on the internet and saying thoughts and prayers does not help people. He says love them in deed and in truth. Deed is Christ-like behavior. It's Christ-like compassion. And truth is the gospel. Don't let the, don't let the culture tell you that love is affirmation. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for somebody is tell them that their actions are taking them to hell. Well, there's a way to do that. I'm not suggesting you go find people you think are blatantly living lives that are opposed to God and you just, you know, do the whole, well, you know, you're going to hell, right? That's not the point. You shouldn't be happy about it. The goal is that you go to that person and you love on them by saying, hey, you know, there's a better way. 
There's another way to act. You know who you have the most opportunity to do this with is the people you already know. They're already in your circles. Listen, all school year long, I go to TCC every Thursday for BCM, and we run into a lot of people living counter to God. And as we get to know them, and we say, hey, you know there's a better way? Because we care about them, they find Jesus. There's a couple of people in this room that found Jesus that way. Are you willing to give up your Thursday night? Are you willing to give up your Sunday morning to serve in kids ministry, serve in youth? What if you need to lead a Sunday school class and tell some seventh grader about Jesus? Because maybe he, maybe he gets a ride from a friend and his parents don't know about Jesus either. And they're not going to tell him. Are you willing to give of yourself to love the brothers? Look at verse 19. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will set our heart at ease before him, that if our heart condemns us, that God is greater than our heart, and, if he, and he knows all things. Beloved, if, your heart does not condemn, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Okay, I want you to see this. This is actually an incredibly interesting phrase right here. I'm actually going to start with verse 21. This is vital. He says, if our heart does not condemn us, that we have confidence before God. What is that? That means if, as you've been sitting here tonight, listening to me talk, and you've said, you know what? I love church. I love the church. I love the people in the church. It brings me life every Sunday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every chance I can be in the building. I'm here because I love this place and I love these people. If that has been your heart's reaction to this message, then you have confidence in your salvation. It is an assurance that you have what is a weird and unnatural love of God's children. That is an assurance. You all of a sudden have peace confidence to stand before God and say, God, I must be one of yours because I love you and everybody that's connected to you. That is the peace in our hearts when we love the church. It's when our hearts do not condemn us. It's those who have prepared for the test. So then what's going on in verse 20? It's a weird phrase. What you have to understand is that John is not writing to any unbelievers. He's writing to believers. Right? So he says this phrase where he says, well, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God knows everything and he's greater. And it's like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? What he's saying is, if you're sitting here and you feel the Holy Spirit convicting you that you have hatred in your heart towards a brother or sister, or that you won't truly give of your time, that you won't truly sacrificially love the church the way you know you should, I have great news. That conviction is an assurance because unbelievers don't feel that way. You can scream at an unbeliever all day about not loving the church and they will go, all right, who cares? That's the whole point. What he's saying is if you love the church, you can be at peace and have confidence before God. And if you're convicted about how much you are doing a bad job at loving the church, rejoice because God is greater and he knows all things. Because guess what? It's not the level at which you love the church that gets you into heaven. It is the fact that you love the church that shows you are reacting to what gets you into heaven, which is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is not your effort that does it. But if you don't have confidence before God that you love the church, and you don't have conviction before God that you're not loving the church the way you should, then you might be the person who's not feeling a thing, and that's the person that needs to get shaken awake because they're going to get to heaven, and Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. You didn't love my bride. You didn't love my children. I'm sorry, we never had a relationship. I don't care how many times you were in the building or said the name Jesus Christ. The assurance, the assurance, think about it like this. Assurance is an outward sign of an inward truth. The inward truth is that Jesus has saved me. The outward sign is that I love his church. If you don't love his church and you don't even feel like you should, there's a good chance something on the inside is missing. 
That is the point. There is something here. I'm not saying you have to be perfect and have complete peace in, in no, I love the church with everything's in me. That's a great place to be. I encourage you to chase that. But even if you're over here and you're going, man, I just, I know I don't love the church the way I'm supposed to. But I want to. I just got all these things going on. Okay. Repent of those things knowing that God is great, that he knows all things, and that it's what he has done that has saved you and secured you. And when you see that forgiveness, react to it. React to it by loving him and loving the church. Look at verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Okay, this is, I'm going to pause on this verse. This is one of those magic prayer verses in the Bible, right? There's several of them where we're like, if I ask God for stuff, he's going to give it to me, right? It says it right there. And there's several of these. And it's, it's really confusing because we read these verses in isolation and then we, and then we misinterpret what they mean. See, we have John 15, 7, which says, if my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. We have Matthew 7, 7 that says, ask and it'll be given, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be open. And then we get to one of the key verses, James 4, 3, that says, you ask and you don't have because you ask for the wrong reasons that you might spend it on your own passions. Notice that that key element is in this verse. He says, because... We keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to him. How do you see your prayers answered in your life? You don't know how you see your prayers answered? You stop seeing prayer as a way to convince God to do what you want, and you start understanding that prayer is a way that God shapes you to do what he wants. See, as you begin to obey God, which is what? I said loving God and loving his children. Then you begin to want what God wants when God wants it. And when that's the case and you say, God, I want this thing. God goes, me too. And then it happens. That's how prayers get answered. See, the other element here. It's partly this believing and obeying, wanting what God wants, and it's doing what's pleasing in his sight. I, I want to give you one of the best phrases you can ever pray in your prayers. Incorporate this into your prayer life. God, I want that if it is pleasing in your sight. Here's the deal. We make assumptions that God will only give us good things. Sometimes it is good in God's sight that we go through bad things. Why? Because it makes us more Christ-like. Or it gives us an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody else. I mean, you think, how could God ever want me to fail a test, especially if I've studied for it? Well, what if it's good in God's sight that you would fail that test and react in a way that makes you more Christ-like? What's more important, that test or that you have eternal impact that your soul looks more like Jesus what if the reaction to that bad thing happening makes a non-believer in your vicinity look at you and go how exactly did you just react like that and then you get to say well let me tell you about what I believe let me tell you about the impact that Jesus had in my life and how I don't look at the things right in front of my face I don't look at my immediate circumstances I look at eternity and when I see eternity, I don't worry about the bad stuff happening to me right here, right now. See, one of the greatest things you can do is go before God and say, God, I want this, but I desperately only want it if it's good in your eyes. And if it's not good in your eyes, Lord, desperately take it away from me. I never want to receive anything that is not from God Colossians tells us that, not Colossians, I can't remember. There's a verse that says, every good thing comes down from the Father, to whom there is no variation or shifting shadow due to change. See, if it's not from God, it's not good. I only want what God has to give me. And what God has to give me ultimately is not things, it's not stuff, it's Christ's likeness. It's life. It's connection to him. And the more life I have, the more confidence that I have it. 
the more sure I am that I know him. You want confidence before God? Grow in Christ-like love of believers in the church. See your prayers answered because your heart is molded to the desires of God's will. Look at verse 23. We have confidence because of the reason we love the brothers. Look at verse 23. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandment remains in him, and he in him. We know by this that he remains in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. I want you to see this. I tell you guys this all the time, but the entire Bible can be summarized in this phrase, love God and love others. That is the whole Bible. Whole Bible is teaching us how to love God and how to love what he loves. Right? That is the goal. Verse 23 is reiterating this. Believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ. Love God and love one another just as he commanded us. Now, pay attention. It's love one another. How? Just as he commanded us. What does that mean? How do you love other people? You point them back to Jesus. You want the best assurance you can have in your entire life? Does any part of your life point anybody around you back to Jesus Christ? Let's make it even more thorough. Does every part of your life point people back to Jesus Christ? Even when I mess up, even when I fall into sin, do you know what I want? That my reaction to sin points people back to Jesus Christ because my reaction should be repentance, confession. It should be to turn. Even when I make a mistake, I want that my life points people back to Jesus. It can't be enough for you that you come to church on Sunday morning and you you put on your best Sunday dress and you carry your biggest study Bible and you think, well, everyone here thinks I follow Jesus, so that's not how that works. When you go to work on Monday morning, is any part of your life pointing your coworkers back to Jesus? Is any part of what you do at school pointing people to Jesus? Do your neighbors have a chance to look out their window and see you doing something and think, that person leaves every Sunday morning for church, but that is not what Christians are supposed to look like. Does your life constantly, constantly contradict who you're supposed to be, or does your life point to Jesus? Here's the thing. It is only possible to love God and love others if you have been loved by God. See, the internal truth that God has loved you and saved you should exhibit itself in a reaction that loves who God loves. Verse 24, I want you to see is reminiscent of John 14, 21, where Jesus tells us that we are a new creation. See, your flesh is going to be with you until the day you die and you're perfected and glorified in heaven. It's going to be there. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. But the question is, are you going towards Jesus or are you going away from Jesus? Because going towards Jesus is an indication that you have been made new. You can't go towards Jesus unless you're his. You can fake it, but even you know that's the case. If you are going away from Jesus in your actions, that is evidence that you are not a new creation. It says that he remains in us by the spirit whom he has given us. When you read this, does somebody talk to you? When you read this, does somebody teach you things? Things revealed to you in this? Does this come alive to you? Now, again, I get it. Some days are hard. Don't ever hear me say, if every single day you don't open this up and just have your mind blown by the craziest, awesome, most awesome concept ever, that you're not a believer. That's not my point. But when an unbeliever opens this book, it is nothing more than just words on pages. When you open this book up, it should bring you life. 
It should be living. The Holy Spirit should be speaking to you using God's word and it should change you from the inside out. You want assurance? Go talk to the Holy Spirit and if he talks back, you know him. One time I was up late one night dealing with my own assurance going, God, tell me I'm yours. Tell me that I'm a child of the living God and that I serve you and I love you. And in, in just this moment of clarity at like two in the morning, God just said, well, who are you talking to? And I was like, oh. Because <laughs> I was talking to him and he was talking back at, at, a, at a minimum, at a minimum, I must believe in somebody I'm talking to. And even better than that, I know he talks back to me. See, the Christian life is slowly learning to better and better hear the voice of God. You know, part of the reason we struggle with assurance is because we're in this baby believer phase where we haven't learned to hear God's voice and we're always in a panic mode over it. Okay? Do you know what you do to learn to hear God's voice? You listen for it more often. If you hear God's voice on a regular basis, you will become accustomed to hearing it. Now, I'm not saying it's just this automatic for, for you at some point. You're just like, yeah, I can just, I can just hear God's voice anytime. No, God's constantly teaching me how to hear his voice better and better and better. That is the Christian life. It is growing and hearing God's voice. But that's why we train at it. I'm better today at hearing God's voice than I was a year ago. I'm definitely better than I was four years ago. Because I spend time asking God to talk to me and learning to hear him. And now when he talks, I go, that was God. And you know what? Then I write it down. I know that journaling is like the worst nightmare, especially of the guys in the room. But hear me out. If the God of all creation says something to you, don't you think you should keep that somewhere? Part of the reason we forget that God has spoken to us is because we don't even record it. We don't even bother to commit it to ourselves. And you know what happens? The enemy comes in right behind that and says the only thing he's been saying since the very beginning. Did God really say that? That's what assurance is. It is the battle of being able to say, yes, God is real and he spoke. And because he's real, and because he spoke, I'm saved. And now that I'm saved, I can't help but love him and love who he loves. Loving God's children is a reaction to God's love of me. Do you want confidence? Stop Chasing a perception of your lack of sin. How is that anything other than pride? Even if you never told anybody, you want to feel good about yourself that you're not as bad a sinner as everybody else. I have really bad news for you. You are. You are just as guilty. You are just as corrupt. You are just as rotten to the very core. Now that we're past that, now we can all face it together knowing we're all in the exact same boat, needing the exact same Savior and the exact same amount of grace, infinite, and we can praise God that that's the case. Quit trying to convince yourself you're better than, than you feel in this moment, that you're more sinless than you feel in this moment. Quit chasing that all together. Chase Repentance. Chase grace. And, and actually, it's even, it's even easier than that. You don't even have to chase grace. It chases you. That's the love of God. That grace came and found you while you were desperately running from it. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. You've never been loved by God. You don't even know what that feels like. You don't love God. You don't love the church. You're not connected to what God is connected to. But you can be. 
That grace is chasing you right now. If that's you, after I pray, we're just going to be here for a moment, but I want you to understand that if you will come talk to someone, we can introduce you to Jesus. You can see how that love can be extended to you and you can begin to react to it. You can know that you're experiencing life and you're going to heaven. Some of you, you sat through this entire sermon and all you felt, all you really felt was some level of shame or conviction that you're not who you're supposed to be. You don't love God and you don't love His children the way you know you should. I want to give you permission right now to silence that voice that is hammering you, that's telling you you're not good enough. And I want you to understand that God has already forgiven you. And when you accept that reality, when you understand that freedom, you can begin to love Him and love His people the way that you were always supposed to. Maybe you have let the world Take the place of God in the church in your life. Maybe all you need to do is come kneel at this place and spend some time in God's presence and say, I'm tired of not having confidence that I'm your child. I'm going to pray. If you need to spread out, if you need to kneel down, if you need to lay on your face, you do it. You have freedom in this room, but don't leave tonight without settling business that you have with God so that you can have confidence to stand before Him. guys, this is Matt O'Mealy, pastor to young adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that is defined by real transformation and the sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We are available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.